in our old house, we had a hallway that was lined with pictures of our family members. We had our grandparents and our parents, our kids and our grandkids. The whole family lined up there along those walls. And we used to jokingly call it the wall of shame. But in truth, we treasured those pictures. I know I certainly did because they made me feel like a time traveler. And they situated me there within that stream of history from our grandparents to our grandchildren. And it made me feel connected in a way that was, oh, maybe not magical and mystical, but an important reminder of where I was situated in that stream of life. And when we read the Gospels, in many ways, that's exactly what we're doing. We're standing in that stream of history, and we're looking at it not just simply to learn historical facts, but we're looking at it to see lines of inheritance and features of, well, family resemblance. When we learn about Peter and James and John and Thomas, these are not just plaster saints, they're not action heroes. Oh sure, the church came to recognize them indeed as saints and they did render them in plaster, but they were very much flesh and blood people like you and me. And when we read their stories, we ought to think of them as people who are in our own family tree, people who might be pictured there on the hallways of our own homes and to see how we're like them and what we receive from them. This first Sunday after Easter always tells the same story. We examine it every year. And it begins on the evening of Easter Sunday. And of course, we know what happened on Easter Sunday morning. The women have had that encounter with Jesus at the empty tomb. Peter and the disciple whom Jesus has loved have run and seen the empty tomb, but they have not encountered the risen Christ. They've seen the evidence of his resurrection, and they return back home. And there they are, huddled behind solid walls and locked doors, much like ourselves this Easter season. And in that environment, Jesus appears to them. And he offers them his peace. You know, it could have gone otherwise. When you think about what they had done, they had not really been what you call model disciples. When Jesus was arrested and tried and executed, his disciples were not standing with him. They weren't terribly faithful. They denied him. They deserted him. They betrayed him. And so when he appeared in their midst, I don't think they were dead certain that he came to offer them anything other than perhaps judgment, fire, fury. But instead, he offers them peace. And then he shows them his wounds. Now, you know, I don't think that those wounds were offered to his disciples simply as a matter of authentication. See, I really suffered. See, it's really me. I mean, there is that. But I think it's also a matter of saying to them, I offer you my peace, but I do so in the context of revealing to you what this has cost me. That my love for you has borne this pain. And I'll always bear the mark of this. Because I will always love you in this way. So Jesus appears to his disciples and he shows them the wounds that he's borne. And then he breathes on them. And confers to them his Holy Spirit. And, and basically calls them to life, just as a new act of creation, just as God breathed into the inanimate mannequin of Adam and made a living being, so Jesus comes to his disciples, dead as they are in fear and trembling, and breathes life into them, and then confers upon them his mission, his ministry, to do what it is that God has sent him to do to offer forgiveness. They're overwhelmed. 
And you know, because we look at this story every year, that the key point of this story is that Thomas isn't there. Why Thomas isn't there, we don't know. This year, we would assume it's because Thomas had the only face mask, had the only pair of gloves, and so they sent Thomas out to buy groceries. But we don't know why Thomas was missing in this first story. But we do know that when Thomas gets home, holy cow, boy, he is given the best, you'll never believe what happened while you were gone kind of story that's ever been told. And Thomas doesn't believe it. Oh, he'd like to believe it. It's a wonderful story. It would really satisfy his desires. It would, it would ease his heart and mind. But, you know, old Tommy, he went to GCC, Galilee Community College, and he took some psych classes, and he knows about mass hysteria, and he knows that this just fits too much into wish fulfillment to be trustworthy. And so he says to his friends, Jesus came to you. He showed himself to you. He revealed his wounds to you. And that's wonderful. And that's why you believe him. But unless I have a similar experience, I just can't believe what you're believing. Now, Sandy absolutely forbade me to entitle this sermon, I'll have what he's having. But that's what Thomas is saying. He's saying, I'd love to believe, but I need to experience what you have experienced. Thomas doesn't believe it. Now, you know, my friends, if I was the kind of preacher who was prone to cheap rhetorical tricks, I could use this story to make you feel about that big. But, of course, I'm not that kind of preacher. That kind of preacher would say, the reason that Thomas didn't believe his brother disciples is because even though Jesus came to them, showed his wounds to them, breathed his Holy Spirit upon them and conferred them with the ministry and mission that Jesus had been about. A week later, they're still locked behind solid walls and barred doors. And so Thomas is saying, essentially, look at you show no sign that you've been encountered by the risen Christ, so why should I believe that you have been? So a manipulative, rhetorically cheap trick playing preacher would take that story and say the reason that the world doesn't believe in the resurrection of Jesus is that the church that Jesus left behind shows no evidence that we've been encountered by the risen Christ. That's what a preacher who's prone to that kind of nonsense would say, but not me, not ever. And seriously, I won't say it. And I don't say it. Thomas expected, perhaps, to see that his disciples, his friends, who were scared to death and locked behind solid walls and barred doors, would become fearless saints. But if he did, he was expecting more than is realistic for him to expect. To expect them to instantaneously be transformed, it's just not fair. It's not biblical either. It takes, I think, repeated reinforcement, continual re-encounter with the risen Christ to begin to incorporate the reality of what Christ has done for us, to hear more clearly his words of peace, to experience more fully the life that he has caused to well up within us, and to be able to have the courage and the vision to go out and continue his ministry of justice and peace, of forgiveness and reconciliation. It doesn't happen in a moment. It happens by repeated meetings with the risen Christ. You know, some churches, many churches, celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion every Sunday, and they do it for just that reason. Because the more often we encounter the risen Christ, become one with him, the more likely we are to show evidence that we have been met by him and to be effective in his ministry. And that's why I commend frequent communion to anyone who would ask. 
And the epistle of 1 Peter tells us it's not just an encounter with Christ that causes us to be transformed. It is also the necessary suffering of our lives when it's offered up in faith and in trust, walking with Christ, that shapes us. It is the stone on which the blade of our faith is sharpened. It's the fire that tempers the steel. None of these things happen instantaneously. If you're an old codger, you will remember from the 1970s when Lipton came out with their instant soup. And if you're too young, you can look it up on YouTube. I'm sure that the commercial is somehow enshrined there someplace. But in that ad, they had a precocious little kid who's watching his mother make this instant soup. Now this instant soup was you know, a batch of chemicals that probably make you glow in the dark and, and a handful of skinny little pasta. And you just add boiling water to it and it makes soup. And so the precocious little kid standing there next to his mother is saying, is it soup yet? It's the same junk they put into the envelopes to call cup of soup. You recognize this. And sometimes I think we as Christians, we expect that God is going to make that kind of transformation in our lives that by just adding boiling water, poof, instant saints. Now, instant soup is to homemade soup as reality TV is to reality. You know, there, there's a semblance of a connection, but just that. And we know that if you're gonna make real soup, it takes time. Things have to simmer. Flavors have to marry. And you have to be patient. And when God makes saints, whether it was Thomas and James and John and Peter, or whether it's you and me, God does not zap us in the micro to make saints. God is about slow cooker Easter recipes that start with a word and an encounter and evidence of God's love. And they just keep cooking and cooking and marinating and simmering. And the recipe really never calls for an end. Amen.